Human activities have brought our planet to the brink of a climate crisis. Today, I'm going to talk about a way we can fix it. Global warming is undeniable. The beginning of this century has seen 14 of the 15 hottest years ever recorded. Climate change has already affected us all, but brace yourself. A recent report by the Pentagon highlighted the risks to national and global security. Climate change will exacerbate deprivation, conflict, and war. Communities everywhere are reeling from record-breaking costs of coping with extreme weather. Yet more and more carbon dioxide, the main climate-altering greenhouse gas, is accumulating in the atmosphere. The world's top climate science panel has been telling us for years that global emissions must be cut by at least 80% in just a few decades. The USA is the largest per capita emitter by far, and that doesn't even include emissions from manufacturing our consumer goods abroad. So we've got to cut further and faster. But how can we possibly make the cuts that scientists say are necessary? A carbon tax raises the cost to burn fossil fuels and emit carbon dioxide. It makes every action that reduces fossil fuel use less costly by comparison. Billions of daily decisions will be influenced, long-term investments too. No other policy can match a carbon tax's reach or its simplicity. The tax is levied wherever fossil fuels are extracted or imported, just a few thousand points in the U.S. The tax is pegged to the carbon content of fuel. Costs are passed down the supply chain to the extent the market allows. Later, we'll discuss how consumers can get money back. A carbon tax can help us make real progress toward averting climate catastrophe. One carbon tax bill would cut U.S. carbon emissions by around 40% in just 15 years, putting us well on the way to 80% by 2050. The tax should start small to let households and businesses adapt and ramp up steadily and predictably. Coal, oil, and gas will be replaced by efficiency and clean, renewable energy. It can be implemented quickly and replicated globally, driving down global emissions. None of the alternative policy approaches are as simple, effective, or transparent. For example, clean tech subsidies have their place, but they cost money in tax dollars. And guess who they benefit the most? The rich, since they use the most energy. Plus, lowering the price of all good technologies isn't nearly as effective as raising the price of the bad. Ending harmful fossil fuel subsidies can also help, but not enough. A carbon tax can accomplish far more. In the U.S., giveaways to fossil fuel companies are dwarfed by the environmental costs of burning carbon. Efficiency standards have been tremendously productive. Today's appliances are two or three times as efficient as 40 years ago. Yet, because they don't address consumption, we end up with fuel-efficient SUVs and energy-efficient mansions. Running in place isn't good enough. You may have heard about the EPA's Clean Power Plan, but don't get too excited. It only applies to electricity. Its emission targets are meager, and it's bureaucratic and complicated the opposite of a carbon tax. Another widely discussed policy option is called cap and trade. This already exists in the European Union, California, and some northeastern states. A cap on carbon pollution sounds good in theory, but you can't have a cap without trading emission permits, which means Wall Street insiders make money off complex markets, insider trading, and price volatility. The EU lost billions this way. Plus, there's no one-size-fits-all cap. We can't ask poorer countries to cut emissions as much as Americans, whereas a carbon price can translate from one country to another. Can we design a carbon tax to benefit poor and middle-income Americans and not increase the size of government so conservatives might buy in? Yes. There are two approaches. One approach is tax shifting, where revenue from the carbon tax is used to reduce existing payroll, income, or corporate taxes. As Al Gore has said, tax what we burn, not what we earn. The other approach is to divide the revenue pie into millions of equal slices, with every household getting an identical piece or dividend. Since the wealthy use more energy, this tactic is income progressive. Either of these approaches would keep the tax fair and effective. 
Of course, any attempt to stop global warming must include China, which recently passed the U.S. as the largest overall emitter of greenhouse gases. For years, the governments of the U.S. and China used each other's inaction to justify their own. But finally, that changed in 2014. The next step is for both countries to start taxing carbon. Even if the U.S. goes first, our carbon tax won't push manufacturing jobs offshore. Trade agreements allow the U.S. to tax the carbon content of imports from China, just like other countries can tax the carbon content of our exports. Some countries have begun taxing carbon emissions. Canada's third largest province began phasing in a carbon tax in 2008. British Columbia's carbon tax is popular and effective. Sweden has been taxing some carbon emissions since the early 90s, as has much of the rest of Europe. In the U.S., public opinion is swinging to favor action on climate, and polls are starting to show support for taxing carbon on both sides of the political divide, so long as it's done fairly and without making government bigger. Yet climate denialists in Congress stand in the way. Low oil prices could open the door to a carbon tax. Congress could enact a tax on petroleum products with the proceeds refunded to households. This could help keep gas guzzlers on hold and establish the precedent of taxing and dividending carbon emissions. In conclusion, a carbon tax can work. There's broad support for action and an urgent need. And the benefits extend even beyond protecting future generations from climate change. Join the growing movement for a U.S. carbon tax. Sign up for the Carbon Tax Center's email list at www.carbontax.org.